Hi, my name is Judith, and today I'm gonna talking gonna talk about urban composting, which is quite a journey for us, and we've been doing it for almost two years now. And I will start with our zero waste journey because that's what led us to composting. And you probably heard about the three R's, which is reduce, reuse, and recycle. But the five R's are more complex and um, a bit more deep uh, interpretation of the term zero waste. Uh, we first encountered zero waste um, about three years ago when we've uh, heard about this lady on the left side of the screen. She's called uh, Lauren Singer. Uh, she has a business called Trashes for Tossers and she has a YouTube channel and she talks about zero waste. Going zero waste means that you practically can store all your trash in a mason jar, uh, like she holds in her hand about two years of trash. There is another lady called Belle Johnson. She is the, the author of The Zero Waste Home, and uh, she is the one who introduced these five R's, which are refuse, reduce, reuse, recycle, and rot. Well, uh, we were quite good at refusing things already. This practically means that you don't buy what you don't really need. So you refuse buying like the 10 t-shirts or anything you don't actually need and you refuse package goods and disposables. Uh, you have uh, reducing means reducing uh, the things you already own and reducing your consumption. So for example, we stopped buying uh, excessive amounts of food that went to the bin and we reduced our consumption in, in many other ways. Re reuse and repair is, I think, doesn't need any explanation in a hackerspace <laughs> environment because you already rep repair many things. And recycle goes without saying. I think everyone recycles. But rotting it was something we thought cannot be done in an urban environment. Uh, we live on the second floor uh, of a condominium uh, in a flat, which has only a small balcony. And um, yeah, we thought rotting was impossible. But then Bell Johnson suggested that you should analyze the contents of your bin. It, it's not an easy task because usually you just throw whatever you have in the bin. Uh, but when you write everything you have, like I've thrown one napkin, three rotten tomatoes, um, something that was broken, and when you have a list, you can see which parts of your consumption need improvement. Well, <laughs> our bin uh, was practically full of biodegradable things, like 60 to 80 percent every week, and we knew that the only way to reduce this kind of waste was composting, which, which is a fancy word for rotting. <laughs> and this is where composting came uh, into our mind. But traditional composting, I think you've seen it in farms, it's a huge wooden frame that it's quite spacey, like one or two meters by one meter. And it's put directly on the soil, so it's usually done in a garden, prefer preferably a big garden. It, it, um, it doesn't have anything underneath it, so it, it needs contact with the soil. And uh, it takes about, well, half a year or years to decompose completely. And you have to turn it completely, uh, like every few months. It smells, <laughs> and uh, it's open, and prey to many kinds of animals. Um, like rats, for example, that we didn't want in our flat. So I, we discarded the idea of composting until a friend of mine came round. She lives in a similar flat as we, and she said that, well, I think I'm going to do composting from, from next week. And I was like, wow, are you going to move or something? And she said, no, in my flat. And that's where the magic word vermiculture came into the <laughs> equation. Vermiculture is, well, I, I checked it on Google if it has <laughs> any kind of, I don't know, explanation, but is the c cultivation of earthworms, especially uh, in order to use them to convert organic waste into fertilizer compost. And where 
traditional compost is in a huge wooden frame. Vermiculture is in a small box, like, uh, like this small. So you can keep it even on your balcony or in your home. It needs very little space and it's a completely enclosed system. It doesn't have any contact with the soil. And it takes about six to eight weeks to start rotting. It has no smell. It, it smells like very good potting soil. And it has a lid that you can put on it and you can't see anything. So it was, it was magical. <laughs> and then we started to build our first vermiculture box. Um, it costs about maximum 10 euros to build a vermiculture box. And you can use it for years. You need two buckets. Any kind of bucket will do. Uh, some people use paint buckets, like 16-liter six, paint buckets. Uh, and we bought uh, two IKEA boxes, these uh, see-through clear boxes um, that are about this big. And we've had one that's, that's a bigger one and a shallow one. Uh, it needs a lid, six yogurt containers or any containers to separate the boxes because they would um, just fit into each other too closely and it needs ventilation. So you need any kind of separator, a piece of polyester fabric that can be recycled. For example, you can use an old, um, an old polyester curtain or a mosquito net or an old polyester bag. It, it doesn't matter, but it cannot be cut in, <laughs> otherwise the worms will eat it. You need a knife or a power drill, three to six bins of worms, and that, that is about 20 to 40 worms, and some soil to start with. Then, first you make the upper box. You prepare it by draining uh, drainage holes. Um, you don't need too many, but you have to have enough so that um, the liquids can drip from the compost. You have to line this box with the polyester fabric. And then you insert the worms, uh, the soil, and some optional food scraps. This is optional, but it, I think you should add some something to eat <laughs> to them, because otherwise they will die in a few weeks. Um, but you don't need much, so you need about maximum 10 centimeters of soil, 5 to 10 centimeters. This is the upper box, and then you prepare, uh, prepare the lower box by placing the yogurt containers or any container in it, uh, and drill some ventilation holes in the lid, and you put this whole system together, and then it's done. So <laughs> you have the lid with the ventilation holes, the big box with the worms and the soil, and the polyester lining, the shallow box with the separators, and you just push it together. And then the boring part begins. <laughs> because you have to wait about six to eight weeks for something to start. And in these six to eight weeks, which is practically two months, you have to care for your worms and, uh, and learn about them. Uh, first, you have to collect scraps for them to eat. Uh, we use an old ice cream bucket for the scraps that, that is on the kitchen counter. And uh, you can put anything from tea leaves to um, apple peels, cotton pieces, wool. I, I will have a complete list of things you can compost at home uh, that you should start collecting. In, in the winter it's easier because it can be on the counter, but in, in summer, uh, after a few days, I usually put it in the fridge with the, with the lid on, and I store it there because the fruit flies will, will eat it. <laughs> um, it is better to chop all the things you have or blend it. I've, I've read it already that blending makes it so much easier for them to eat. So I'm, uh, I usually either blend or chop everything finely. And um, you have to use it up regularly. That's basically feeding the worms regularly. And you have to find a rhythm. For us, it is about one week. <clears throat> so every weekend, we, we feed the worms by 
mixing up the contents of the box, mixing in the new things, and we always layer new, old, new, old. <laughs> and you have to finish with soil, because uh, if you leave it open, like with the food scraps on the top, other animals will find it, and you don't want that. So this layer of soil is very important to regulate the temperature, <coughs> the humidity, <coughs> and it will keep out insects and rats and mice you don't want in your compost. And it will just cover the worms because they, they will never come up to the surface unless anything is very, very wrong in your compost. So you have your key indicators that are humidity, temperature, and the speed of composting. And the worms love to be in a dark and humid place, like in the, s in the ground, in the soil. And if, it, if your compost gets too wet, they will suffocate. They will, first they will come up to the surface, but then they will have nowhere to go and they will die. And if the temperature goes down to seven degrees, they will slow, well, really, really down. <laughs> so they will practically stop eating and they freeze at zero degrees. So you have to keep an eye on them because they, they die after a while. And when it's warm, they work faster. So in the summer, you can count on them when you eat fruits and veggies. And the more worms, the faster the process is. And you have to know that they avoid daylight. So anything that's uh, on the surface, they, they won't eat because they won't come up for, for it. They will only go down into the darkness. And you have to maintain this balance of humidity, temperature, and the speed of composting. And balance is um, mixing the right amount of brown ingredients and green ingredients. Anything counts as brown that is dry, like uh, leaves or a straw or any dried plant. And anything counts as green that's wet. For example, rotten fruits or, uh, or anything that's, that's juicy. And you need about one part brown and two parts green for the balance, but it depends on the climate and where you live. So you have to, you will see when it gets too wet and you will see when it gets too dry and you have to keep it in, in balance. And there are a few common mistakes that you can make. Your compost get, can get too wet, but, but it's easy to fix because you can add some dried leaves, for example, or you can collect anything and, and dry it first and only add it later. Or it, the, your compost can get too dry, but then you can either add water or you have uh, juicy food scraps, or the temperature, will, temperature can go down. And I think you should bring them in uh, when it's about seven degrees, and you don't necessarily have to bring it into your home. Uh, you can use either a garage or your basement to keep them safe and warm, or you can cover it, or use lamps to make them warm, but I think the easiest is to put them in the basement, <laughs> and, and they will like it there. And I think it can never get too warm in, in Europe for them, but they hate direct sunlight. So try keeping them in the shades. And these are the only mistakes you can make practically <laughs> because they are quite durable. And your compost uh, shouldn't have any odor. It, it smells like very rich potting soil, like the one you can buy at the, um, the flower market. So it's, it's a really good quality soil. Uh, it shouldn't have too much mold in it. <laughs> some is okay. And the worms should be inside the box, not outside. <laughs> if you see worms outside the box or creeping up or on the floor, then it, it's, a sign of, uh, it's a sign that something is going wrong. For example, it's too wet, too dry, or too cold for them. And there, after a while, you, <laughs> you will find a few insects in it, um, but usually they just help the worms and, and they they are not harmful for your compost. And the top layer will always be a bit dry, especially in the summer, but underneath it, you should see that it's moist. And uh, as one of my friends said it quite sadly, it's just a box of soil. And yes, it is. <laughs> and, it, and it doesn't have anything disgusting on the top. And you should keep layering it 
and you will see some results in two months. When? <laughs> well, these first few weeks are really boring and they are really about reaching the state of equilibrium, but after it, you can start harvesting the compost. Um, well, that's basically the whole goal of composting, the, the harvesting. You will have two products, the compost itself and the byproduct that's called worm tea. And that's why you need the shallow box under it, because that is collecting the worm tea. That's practically water and nutrients that you can collect and use as a fertilizer for your, I don't know, what, uh, garden. <laughs> and after these first six to eight weeks, you leave them alone for two weeks and they eat everything they find in the box. And then you should sift the contents of the box to separate the compost and the worms. And that's it, you will have compost. <laughs> and you can store it for up to six to 12 months without losing any power, but in, it, it just becomes less rich soil after keeping it for longer times. And you can harvest about three to four times a year, depending on how much compost you need. So a year with your vermiculture looks like this. First you have the, the starting up weeks, then two weeks breaks and you can harvest. And then you feed and compost in 10 to 12 weeks periods. So it's usually you can harvest it three or four times a year. But if you don't need the compost, you can leave it there. And like, there are some frequently asked questions that we were looking for answers to. And these are, what if my box is full? I think it takes a long time for a box to fill up completely because we are a family of four and uh, we only started the second box because we had a bit of an excess and we didn't want to bother with sifting the, the compost from the first box. So you can use one box for up to two years, even if you are a lazy harvester. And whatever you put in will go down about five centimeters a week. So if you leave it for two weeks, it will go down about 10 centimeters. So the box will practically never get full. Uh, I've mentioned that you should chop and blend the scraps because that helps with with it being composted uh, a bit quicker, and it helps um, to, well, it, it reduces the volume. For example, if you have watermelon peels, if you blend it, it will be about a handful. A, a whole watermelon will reduce to a handful. And if it's not speedy enough or your box is becoming full, you can add more worms anytime. They cost about one euro per box, so they are cheap. <laughs> and you can always add more, but there, there will be more worms as the time goes by because they make babies. And you have about, and they will double in about three months. So you don't really need to buy more worms, but you always can. And what are the insects and larvae in my box? Well, it's, it's actually quite frightening when you first see other insects infesting your box, but they are called uh, decomposers or saprotrophs. And they exist under many forms, for example, mice, centipedes, black soldier flies, and other rotifiers. And especially black soldier fly larvae are really creepy because they are about two centimeter long, white, and, and, and juicy. <laughs> and they are really frightening, but uh, they actually help composting uh, faster, and the worms will eat them, unfortunately. But, but they help and they speed up the process. So you should welcome them and try to cover them up <laughs> in your compost. And uh, if you compost inside the house, you can use uh, any kind of lightweight polyester fabric on the top beneath the lid because that will protect against fruit flies. But other insects are welcome. Even fruit flies can help, but, but usually people hate fruit flies, so you should protect your compost from them. And mold is another question that you should, uh, uh, there should be a U in it, so it's M-O-U-L-D. Well, um, there are two aspects to this question because you can actually put moldy food in the compost box. This won't spoiler, spoil your compost. It will decompose faster. It actually has already started decomposing and the worms just 
eat the moldy parts as well. But when you see mold forming in the box, you should be vigilant because it, uh, it can happen for, for several reasons, but if there's too much mold, the, the worms will die eventually because of the toxins. So some is okay, but you will see the signs when your compost is just rotting and rotting and, and not turning into compost. <laughs> uh, and then you should adjust the humid humidity, for example, by collecting leaves from the streets or dry parts. Mm. And there are some fluids that you will see in your compost box. Um, it's, it's usually just worm tea, which is, mm, I think we've, we've had about three deciliters in the first year, all in all, so it's, it's not much. And your compost should not be dripping or look rainforesty on the inside. It, it should be quite moist, but not too, too wet. And uh, this worm tea is really good because uh, it, it is filtered by the polyester thingy on the, on the underside of the box, and it's a potent fertilizer. You can use it in a solution to one, t uh, one part worm tea and ten parts water. And it's really good because it, it speeds up the growth of the flowers in your garden, so you should keep it. But it, it, it has kind of a weird smell to it, so store it in an airtight <laughs> container. And what can you put in your compost box? Uh, a lot of things. <laughs> um, everything you eat, or uh, even things you don't want to eat, like like eggshells. And there are some things that you cannot put, or you should put only in moderation to the box, like paper, because worms will die if they get too too much paper. You shouldn't put lots of wood in it. For example, you, if you have those wooden or bamboo toothbrushes, if you change them like every three, three or four months, it's okay. But if you are a family of four and you put like four toothbrushes in it every three months, then it won't decompose <laughs> at all, practically. Or it needs more time and your compost will be full of wood. Uh, but you can put some ice cream sticks or small parts of wood in it. And peach pits are also, and any kind of hard shell stone fruits are hard to decompose. So if you have time, you can put it, but we usually avoid it. And here is a very long list of examples that you can put in it, in your compost box. Uh, I would say some interesting thing, things like you can put all the old jam in it if, it if it gets moldy. You can put toothpicks in it. Uh, if you change uh, a few things in your household, like uh, cotton buds to the ones that have only a paper stick and cotton on the end, then you can compost it. And you can put your old uh, flower wreath in it if you are kind of decorating your house. <laughs> or if you get uh, a bouquet, you can compost it later. Uh, if you have pets, you can put fur and uh, feathers in it, and practically anything that's natural. But you will get the idea as you go on. And I think composting is good because it changes your mentality towards buying things. Because once you start composting, you will look for things that are biodegradable, and you will look for alternatives that you can either recycle or compost. And you will have kind of a mindset that, oh, this is compostable, compostable, great, I will choose this one instead of that one. So it, it really changes your whole mentality towards this zero waste attitude. And I think we are at the Q&A section now, if you have any <laughs> questions regarding the talk. Yes? Uh, my question is uh, uh, if the balance of wet and dry things is the main way to control the humidity of the box. Yes. Thank you. Did you, did you thought about uh, monitoring electrical devices, like some humidity sensor and some small... Probably it would be a good idea. We thought about placing... We have a thermometer <laughs> that measures humidity in percentage and, uh, and temperature, but 
it, it stopped working at, at once and, <laughs> and, and we stopped using it, but it, it was on top of the compost. On, on the lid, so we didn't put it inside. But it would be a good idea and, and very hackers, hacker spacey <laughs> to build something to measure it and then we can have results and data and analyze it and... Measurement graphs. Yeah. Yes. You mentioned that it doesn't or barely smells. Yeah. Would you actually have this in your living room or is there... Yes, actually we had it in our living room for, for, for a few weeks. Um, and it didn't have any smell, but the fruit flies started to attack it. <laughs> so fruit flies are a bigger problem than, than smell because it has no smell. And you and you have a lid on it, so it it doesn't come out if it would smell, but it smells like soil. So if you have flowers at home, it has the same smell. I, I didn't quite get what you're doing. Let me try to tell what I understood and then please correct me. So you're collecting your waste for a week uh, in a container, mm -hmm. and then you cut it down, and then comes no, the No, I cut it down or when I collect it. Oh, you're already done. Okay. Yeah, it's easier because then okay. it, it's not okay. moldy. Okay, that makes sense. And then you said there's one day in a week or every two weeks when you put the new stuff on in a layered fashion in the box. How do you do the layering? Do you take out everything and then put new no, layers? No, I just take out a bucket full of, like, we have a very small bucket. It was an old pot, actually. Yeah. We, we take out some soil and we layer it. And you, uh, it's good because the, with the soil you take out worms and then the worms will start going downwards. Okay. And so you always take, before you put in the new stuff, you take off a top layer? Yes. And then you put back that top layer. Yes, basically. Or is and it the top more layer, than one layer usually the top have. Layer is only soil, or is it more um, than the soil layer that you take? More out? than the soil, so, soil layer, because we need some worms okay, that start so, going downwards. Okay. And they will usually go downwards and inside. Mm -hmm. So whatever is in the middle that gets eaten the fastest, because that's in the darkest and moistest, does it exist? The most wet place. Yeah. But you can also just have a pot of fresh soil and layer it, but then it's slower. Yes? Have you tried breaking down PLA, polylactic acid, uh, kind of um, combustible plastic? Not yet. I heard it's possible, but it's very slow. Uh, probably. Mm. I'm not sure if it's... If it, does it need warmth? Warm conditions, like in um, professional composting management thingy, or can it be biodegraded at home? Um, good question. It's, um, I know they can de uh, decompose it in industrial composting uh, systems, but um, those use high temperature. Yeah, I think that can be the problem because it only operates at well, regular, not room temperature, but in the summer it's about 30 degrees or colder, so. Yeah, I think it's broken down by bacteria. It's very common in 3D printing. And I think they make quite a lot of, well, like uh, bags of it. And uh, some of the spoons or uh, ice creams are also, are also on PM. Yeah. But I heard it's only breaks down at uh, 60 degrees. Yeah, that's what I'm afraid of, that it needs higher temperatures and the worms would die at 60 degrees. Sorry? You said that the, the, the higher temperatures gets, are not affecting them, but now you tell us I said that, that it <laughs> won't get too warm, <laughs> because on your balcony it will never get to 60 degrees in direct sunlight. In the next five or ten years afterwards, there's still... <laughs> yeah, afterwards we have to rethink everything, not just vermicultures. <laughs> okay. Any questions? Um, how did the harvesting go? How did you harvest the compost? With, um, how did you get the worms out and then the new compost? We use the sifter. Sieve. Hmm? Sieve. Sifter. Uh, sita. And we just sift. Okay. Uh, or you can hand pick them <laughs> if you have, you know, time. 
but, but usually it's easier to sift it. And you need a sifter of half a centimeter to one centimeter holes, because that's the ideal of potting soil. You can use bigger or smaller, but, but this half to one centimeter is the ideal. You can build it yourself by making a frame, a wooden frame and some um, chicken webs. I think that's what it's called. And what do you do with the old soil that you replace with the new fresh soil? We usually just mix it in the compost and make it ah. better soil. <laughs> But after a while, you don't really have old soil. I mean, you, you have your flowers, and, or you have your garden, and you have your compost. And you just keep it in rotation. And if you have too, too much soil, you can always give it to your neighbors, <laughs> because they will love having it. But then I think you should get the worms completely out of it. <laughs> because my flowers sometimes have worms in it. <laughs> like, um, the, the worms lay eggs, and the eggs are small, see-through, yellowish bubbles. And you can't really get it out of the, the sifted soil. So if the temperature and everything is right in your little balcony uh, potting, then they will become worms again. And sometimes I can see birds coming and looking for worms in my flowers. <laughs> so, yeah. It's it's nature. So nature is happening on the balcony. Are there also other methods for home composting with worms? Sorry? So can you also don't take another animal as a key to compost the tomb? So uh, yes, you can use other. black soldier flies. In the, the ones I've mentioned that uh, the larvae are, are eaten by the worms. But if you don't have the worms, then black soldier fly composting is a thing. But I'm not sure I would like anything that can fly in the house. <laughs> but, but you can actually use these larvae as composters. But these are the only ones I know about. And the black sort of fly are the ones that are about one and a half centimeters big and they, they are buzzy. And they're also super delicious as uh, protein sources. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> I didn't know it. <laughs> With ice cream. With ice cream, it's good. Okay. Any questions? Then try to. <laughs>